star water. There are many ways to approach this. For example, this is a playlist by our buddy MR2Tuff2. Now he takes on the electric aspect of it, a magnetic side to this universe. MR2 can make red tide with just electricity and water. Life in minutes. That's a great video. More importantly, he demonstrates how energy creates water from its components. Did you know that every element needed for life is found in and around plasma? Me either. I'll let him explain. Arcuin convection is, is a naturally occurring plasma, such as lightning or um, you pull the plug out of the wall, that spark that flies out. That's a plasma field of high-charged high energy. And inside these, these high-charged energies, they find the elemental separation has taken place and, and, and you have iron and, and silicon, magnesium, sulfur, carbon, all the way out, you know, through oxygen, hydrogen, helium, towards the outside of the, of the, of the plasma itself. All these elements are present in, in lightning or any type of electric arc. The elements and electricity. Remember those. So from the birth of stars, the birth of solar systems, from icy dust and particles, there's no doubt water can be found in the craziest places around many different types of stars, inside them as well, and in their ejections. Water is there when the stars grow old, when they begin to die. It can also be found in preplanetary nebulae. Mars clearly has water. Enceladus seemed obvious to many. There's water inside Europa. It's on the surface of Io as well. And did you know Pluto was mostly made of water? Me either. In fact, NASA has a nice tool for kids to see where else they can find water within our solar system. Apparently there's a bunch more than I've shown. It's almost everywhere. All the way out to the Oort cloud. <laughs> cloud. What an apt name for the heavens from where the comets rain down. Imagine the comets when our star grows old. So how does this water get to the planets and out to the comets and the clouds? I believe one of the ways is through coronal mass ejections. I'm clearly not saying this is all water. That's preposterous. This is mostly plasma, hydrogen ions, and the first tiny bit of star water. Now these CMEs water the entire solar system, reassembling into the clouds of comets and debris. The CMEs, according to a different arm of NASA, contain these same heavier elements MR2 showed us earlier. Solar wind does this as well, although to a much lower extent with less heavier elements. But solar plasma hits our magnetosphere. Much is guided away or blocked, but some gets integrated. The cloud of energized particles, the elements in the plasma on the sun, in the corona, and in those ejected outward into space in a CME, have an accumulating star water content and these ingredients collide with each other, react, they collide with slower solar wind, and they bunch up when they hit our shields and get juiced with some energy. Now some of these particles are then guided to the Earth on the field lines, but that's mostly near the poles. The magnetosphere doesn't block everything, however, especially already electrically neutral water, and especially not the part that has holes in it, or the weak points. It would, however, cause particles to combine with each other and whatever else is in our plasmosphere, and when you factor in the earthly ionospheric ejections of oxygen during coronal mass ejections, you can see the mixture brewing. There'd be even more brewing for the what got down to the next layer, where the atmosphere meets the ionosphere, the ozone. 10 to 50 kilometers high, water does not evaporate to this altitude. Ozone has lots of oxygen, which reacts very well with those hydrogen ions. So you begin to see the star water process begins at the sun, but also continues through our magnetosphere, plasmosphere, down to our atmosphere. But the magnetospheric holes are not the only ones. Our ozone is developing holes as we speak. Lightning, sprites, these energies are somehow blasting holes in our ozone and allow even more than just UV rays to get through. There are many other shifting inflows and outflows of energy here on Earth. In fact, everywhere in the solar system has these energy flows. They're often cyclonic when strong near the surface, like here at the level of the sun. The differences in electromagnetic force can even show up in the tail of a passing comet. The high energy that penetrates into our levels of Earth moves helically in a vortex. Picture it going around this waveform. 
And if we were watching a radar image instead of vapor intensity, you would see this energy show up as a 2D representation of that 3D vertical motion. It would appear as rings or concentric circles. It's no wonder that this is followed by tornadoes, severe weather, or in this case a hurricane exploding over land with no warning, <laughs> and then dying over the ocean. Just a different energy flow. It's no wonder that vast amounts of water show up there with the holes above, guided by the energy. We have seen rainfall amounts that simply do not make sense. They do not hold their weight against our current weather models. But moving on. The second highest clouds we can see are cirrus clouds. In the stratosphere, five to six kilometers up, interesting that these often precede rainfall. But more than 10 times higher than water is supposed to go up, sitting 85 kilometers on the roof of the ozone. The noctilucent clouds, still a mystery to scientists in many ways. Used to be a rare Arctic phenomenon, but they're now being seen at mid-latitudes daily. They don't know where the water comes from, but they know outer space plays a role with at least meteor particles. Half right's not bad. I imagine other particles might get up there as well, but NASA's claiming that the space dust makes up at least 3% of the noctilucent clouds, and I think that's believable. A significant amount of the remaining 97%, I believe, must be star water. Not only can they not account for the water, but why these clouds have now exploded across the planet. This ties into a significant solar planetary event in our ionospheric layers. This is the critical frequency of the F1 layer in the year 2000. It goes up at the last solar maximum and then back down at solar minimum. But around 2007, an over-ionization of this layer began and kept going. It will be interesting to see what happens this winter. Now there was once a wonderful website named Climate Logic, and I know some of you are going to remember this. It was taken down literally the day after we first shared with you a video showing the F1 layer anomalies corresponded with a deviation from oceanic temperatures relative to solar activity. We got a lot of unexpected heat. The other planets are having electromagnetic issues as well. The Saturn storm up north. It's slowing its rotation, by the way, along with Venus, which looks so bright it almost doesn't make sense. I grew up golfing. I know the morning sky, and this is preposterous. Just wait until Jupiter gets bright in September. The weather on Earth in 2011 woke up a large number of people all on its own. While you look at that weather, please remember that this does not include things like mass animal deaths, and the weather this year has been focused mostly on heat and the drought rather than the early season tropical storm records set this year, which I suppose are easy to forget considering they managed to leave the U.S. relatively unharmed. Or how about how the U.S.'s warm winter might not have been such a good thing? <laughs> An Arctic cyclone like this in summer. For those who say that we would notice all this added star water, I'd say less than 1% of storms are significant star water events. Evaporation is still real and all that other weather stuff. But realize also that Earth expels particles as all things do, from alpha decay at a small scale up to a black hole. This electromagnetic universe pulls in and pushes out. Remember when nothing could escape the gravity of a black hole? Whoops. Time for another theory, guys. Particles and energy expelled electromagnetically. Not to mention those oxygen eruptions Earth has, or the hot flow anomalies seen here and at other planets. Did I mention we also have changing inflows and outflows? There is no conservation here. Gaia taketh, but she also giveth back. I tell you to check your weather every day for a good reason. Star water isn't the problem, but we're going to be seeing a lot more of it and the other devastating storm elements if our energy keeps changing. Eyes on the sun, everyone, but keep your feet on the ground. This is real.